go right into our Bible study, continuing with chapter 12 tonight. And I want to kind of preface uh, our continuation. We have already been in... Uh, chapter 12 goes into the, the basic uh, category of Christian conduct, how Christians are to conduct themselves. Okay, and we've already kind of been covering that, but now as we finish the rest of it, I want you to bear in mind, Paul kind of is giving a list of things, and he's listing how Christians ought to behave. Now, I'm going to tell you, one of the things that I find interesting is, things spiritual tend to work in complete opposition to things natural. Uh-huh. Things spiritual work in complete contrast. In other words, somebody makes you mad in the natural, well, your first inclination is to hate them. Right? You know, your first inclination to get mad and want to, I want my revenge, I want, you know, justice. I want, and you'll find that God calls His people to a spiritual response to things that happen in this life. And those spiritual responses without fail are completely contrary to what is natural and what is human nature. So as we look tonight, let's look. Uh, I'm going to go back to verse 10 again. We, we did this last week. I'm not going to recover it all, but I'm just going to read it. Paul said, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Boy, we got happy talking about that last week, didn't we? Yes. Patient Amen. in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Amen. See, it's easy to be instant in prayer. In one place, the Apostle Paul said that we're to pray without ceasing. And some people would say, well, Paul, you're out of your tree. How in the world can you just pray without ceasing? That means you couldn't do anything else. Well, sure you can. What that means is to have a mindset and an attitude of prayer at all times. To leave the communication and the line with God open 24-7. That's why I say when people have that mindset, when you have that inclination, then when trouble comes, your first response is, Oh, Jesus, help me. Lord, help me. Oh, God, I need you. Well, immediately, the first words that fall off our lips are heavenward. Right. Amen. Amen. It's yeah. just automatic. Because why? Because our communication, we never get off the phone with King Jesus. Yes. Amen. 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 We've always Amen. got him on the line. Yep. I may set the phone down for a minute so I can do business with you. But I know he's still there. Right. And he's hearing every word I say to you. And he's hearing every word you say to me. So you better watch out as well as I better watch out. Amen. Some people say, well, bless God, that means the Christian better watch out. Well, I'm going to tell you, it also means the guy the Christian is dealing with better watch out because I'm the apple of his eye. And you better watch how you do me. You better watch how you treat me. You better watch how you talk to me. Amen. Amen. Oh, I'm going to tell you. You know, people talk about divine favor. We hear that all the time. Yeah. People love to talk about divine favor. Yeah. I'm going to tell you. We're going to get into it in a minute. God said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Right. Ooh, I've had God step in and, and do some things on my behalf. Lord, amen. I've seen businesses go out of business. That's right. Amen. amen. That have done me dirty. That's right. I have. That's right. And I stood there and looked the person right in the eye and said, this place can go out of business. They laughed at me. We've been here 35 years, and you're telling me we're going to go out of business? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And a year later, guess what? The parking right. lot was empty. The building was locked up. They were out of business. That's right. Amen. Worked for a car dealership. Brand spanking new car dealership. Working as a, as a salesman in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Brand spanking new dealership. Do you know how much money it costs to set up a car dealership? Millions of dollars, folks. 
millions of dollars. The people who own car dealerships are rich before they ever open the dealership because you can't afford to open one if you're broke. All right? This man spent millions of dollars to open a brand spanking new car dealership. I was one of the very first salesmen they hired. And they did not only me, but some, you know, the salesmen dirty. They stole from us and all that. And I told them, I said, y'all better be careful because God will shut you down. That's right. I didn't ask God. I didn't curse them. I didn't right, stand there saying, right. yes, God, God, you know. I, that's not what I said. I said, you better be careful because God will shut you in. They laughed right in my face. Mm -hmm. Six okay. months later, it was a parking lot. Oh, yeah. wow. Brand spanking new dealership. You don't ever see that happen. Mm -hmm. You know, but they, you, you, they do studies. They do all kinds of stuff. Research before they put a car lot in a certain location, you know. I mean, you're not going to spend that kind of money just haphazardly yeah. but I've seen God step in so you better I've got Jesus on the line not only can yeah. he hear the way I talk but honey he can hear the way you talk yeah. so you better be careful how you talk amen because my daddy don't take kindly amen. to me being mistreated amen. praise the Lord uh, so continuing instant in prayer now verse 13 is new for us distributing to the necessity of saints Given to hospitality. I'm here to tell you today, it is the responsibility of the church to take care of its own. Amen. Yes. Amen. I'm so sick and tired of churches that they seem to think, Brother Jack, the only job they have is to have church on Sunday and Bible study on Wednesday and pat you on the back and send you home hungry. I don't Amen. believe that way. Amen. Anybody who knows me knows I I don't believe that way. I have a problem with, you know, this, uh, everybody's got their own thing going. Listen, I don't want a socialist government, but I want a socialist church. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord, Amen. did he really say that? Yes, I did. Yes. See, I don't want my government to be socialist. I don't want you to tell me what I can own and what I can't own and what I can run and what I can't run and how much profit I can make and all. I don't want the government to tell me all that. But within the context of a democratic free market economy, I want to be able as the church of the living God to make sure that our people are taken care of. Amen. Uh -huh. That's right. Amen. And when people come into this fellowship and you become a part of this family, we look out for one another. Amen. That's how we do. That's our policy. We're a family. We're the body of Christ. No one cell is off on its own struggling to survive. Mm -hmm. When we go out to eat, everybody goes out to eat. Right. Amen. And if you don't have money, believe me, we'll find it some way, somehow. Yeah. And I've said it many, many, many times before. <laughs> there are times when Tommy and I are so broke, you know, that we can't afford to sneeze. And we'll tell you, I'll tell you honestly, I'll say, you know, I, I can't do anything today, brother. I'm broke, you know. Uh, or sometimes I might say, listen, I can't afford a whole lot, but I can get us a drink. Or how about if I get some chicken nuggets and we share them, you know. But I mean, but I'm going to make sure everybody is equally treated. Amen. Amen. That's how this preacher believes. Amen. And we've got food here at the church that we keep. People come. You know, Sister Freddie used to ask me every once in a while. Uh, Andy would ask me, Brother, would you mind if I got some food from the pantry? Absolutely not. That's what it's there for. Mm -hmm. We're going to take care of our own. I don't like the idea of God's people coming to the house of the Lord hungry and going home hungry. I don't understand that mentality. But folks, that goes on in too many Christian churches. It really does. The Word of God says, you know, what value is there in patting someone on the back and saying, well, be ye warmed and filled. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, what, what good does that do? It accomplishes nothing. Listen, if I'm hungry, don't be telling me you're going to pray for me. <laughs> Especially if I'm hungry, don't be telling me you're going to pray for me. Because when I'm hungry, I turn into a bear. You tell me you're going to pray for me, and I'm probably going to eat you. <laughs> but I mean, that's just foolishness. Amen. You know, it, we cannot be the answer to all the hunger and all the issues in the world. But we certainly can do our best to take care of the needs 
within our own fellowship. Amen. That's right. Our church brother has reached out how many times? Yes. How many times have we had young couples, yes. young families come into this church yes. and as little a group as we are, as few resources as we've got, yes. we have gone out of our way to try to help them every way we can. Right. Sometimes we're able to help them in ways that don't cost any money. Yes. And what I mean yes. by that is, uh, they may be looking for an apartment, maybe their credit isn't good, maybe somebody just got out of jail, whatever, and we know some folks who are willing to take people on our recommendations. Right. So we recommend them, you know. I mean, so uh, otherwise these people be living out of their car, Martin, for months on end. Yeah. You know, yeah. so there's, a, there's help we can offer people. It's not always tangible, you know, financial or whatever. Uh, but we try desperately. Mm -hmm. uh, we bring food to folks when they need food. Mm -hmm. We uh, have helped people put gas in their car, you know, when they yes. needed gas. Yes. And we've done all kinds of things for people. Mm -hmm. And then the minute I have to look at them and say, I'm sorry, but we don't have any resources today. I can't do anything for, for you today. We never see them again. That is one reason why, mm -hmm. now anybody wants to take this as selfish, so be it. That is one reason why we ought to take care of each other. Yes, amen. You know what? You want this church to help you pay your bills, then you be part of this church. Amen. If you're not willing to be part of this church, then go find somebody else to pay your bills. Right. Amen. 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 I don't give a flying leap if you put two pennies in the offering plate. That's not the issue. The issue is, do you at least come to church here? Do you at least support the church with your attendance? I had somebody call me on the phone just a few months ago and give me a story about they had moved to Dallas and they were trying, you know, to, uh, he had come down here for a job and the job fell through or something. And they were staying in a weekly hotel and could we possibly help them with groceries? And I said, well, where are you at? And they told me, and I loaded a whole bunch of groceries up in a box, and I carried them up to the hotel. I sent Tommy a message on my phone, a text message said, I'm going to this hotel, to this room number, in case it was an ambush or something, you know. Right, right. And because you never know what people are up to. Right. But uh, brought these people, you know, big old box of groceries, all kinds of food. I mean, it was enough to carry them for at least a week. Now, did they ever so much as even grace the door of this church as a means of saying, thank you, I appreciate your support? No. No. I'm going to tell you, people in our society today are happy to take whatever you give them. And they're not interested in giving anything back. Now, I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't go to a Mormon church and take food from them if I were starved to death. I wouldn't do it. I'll tell you why. Because I believe their doctrine is demonic and I'm not about to go to their church and sit through a service in appreciation for their help. That's right. And if I'm not willing to do that, then I'm not going to take their help. Right. Amen. So if you're not willing to at least do something, you know, to indicate you're grateful for the help you've received, you know, from a church or a body of people, then honey, don't ask them. Right. Don't ask. I didn't ask for any money. Didn't ask for repay. I took my own time to bring it out to them. I carried it out. Did they didn't even have to come get it? Right. I brought it out to them. But you know, Paul said here, distributing to the necessity of saints. That right. means our first obligation yeah. is within our own fellowship. That's right. Amen. Amen. Right. Our first obligation is within our own fellowship. And if we need to care for anybody, it's for one another. That's right. Amen. Yes, and amen. that's why some people contact me. It makes me laugh. They contact me from out in the boondocks somewhere. You know, they see my name on Facebook. And they figure, boy, I'm an easy mark, you know, because he's a preacher. And they're supposed to just be filled with compassion. And, honey, I can go into tears for you till I cry a mighty river. And that don't put any money in my pocket. Amen. I can cry myself to sleep thinking about the horrible mess you're in, but that doesn't mean I can help you because it doesn't mean I have the resources. Yes, right. But I get all kinds of people, you know, contact me. And the first question I ask them is, 
Well, are you a member of any church anywhere? Do you go to church anywhere? Well, no, I don't. Well, <laughs> then aren't you Paul out of luck? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> aren't you just Paul out of luck? You yep. dummy. Amen. Yep. You know, if you want somebody to help you, it'd be nice if you knew somebody. Yes. It'd be nice if somebody knew you. But instead, you want to walk up to strangers and beg for food. That is just crazy. That is just insane. But we live in a world today, you know, where people do everything on the Internet and everybody lives their own little separate lives. And we don't even, honey, you don't even have to go to any kind of meetings anymore. Us folks that go to church, we're dinosaurs. Good grief. Most people get their church on TV and on the Internet, you know. You don't even need to go to church anymore. Let me tell you something. Yes, you do. I've said it many, many times. Yes, you do. You need to know people and you need to be known by people. You need a network. You need friends. You need a spiritual family. It's important. It's how the kingdom of God works. And the more people are segregated and separated in this world by the internet and television and all these so-called me means of communication, I'm telling you, the more the enemy is playing havoc. That's right. He is. It's divine and conquer. He yeah. is literally Amen. just winning the battle in more and more lives every That's day right. because Amen. people don't realize how important it is to, you know, I keep using the term, to know and be known. Right. It's important. Amen. 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 So the church has an obligation to distribute to the necessity of saints. I had a lady in my first church whose name was June. And June was twice divorced. She had a child from each of her previous marriages. And uh, they, the youngest at that time was like, I think the little girl was maybe five and her son was about 12. And uh, June basically existed on her alimony and child support, you know, and uh, she didn't work. And before she ever stepped foot in our church, uh, Leo and Sue, a young couple in the church, came to me and said, Pastor, uh, we know a lady, and she's a Christian lady. She goes to the assembly of God down here in Shelton, and you know, but she is struggling and having an awful hard time. And that church doesn't do a thing in the world for her. And I said, Well, that's a shame. That's terrible, you know, that the church doesn't help her. I said, We will. Now, I don't put any conditions on that. She doesn't have to come to our church for us to help her. Right. Okay. She's part of the family of God. That's right. From what I read, it said distributing to the necessity of saints. Yes, amen. Doesn't say they have to be part of my church. Mm -hmm. But if they're in God's family, then they're my responsibility. Yeah. And I said, okay, we'll help her. So we begin to send some groceries over to her. Well, of course, she was so grateful. And she came to visit our church one Sunday, and she loved it. And she said, I want to come to church here. But we were meeting in this old dusty hall, you know, in Naugatuck. And uh, it was horribly dusty and terrible. I mean, uh, we were on the third floor of a building and there was a raised highway that ran right outside the window. And I mean, dust was just all over the place. She said, but Pastor, I have asthma and I can't handle all this dust. She said, the minute you move to another location, I'm, this is going to be my church. Well, we moved, she came. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I, You know, after a little while uh, of her coming to the church, she was faithful. That little lady would tithe. I don't care if her, you know, alimony was $500 a month. She tithed her $50. She yeah. tithed on every penny she laid her hands, hands on. If somebody gave her $20, she'd give the church two. <laughs> she did. Yes, and she knew we were going to take care of her. We were, she wasn't out there, you know, on her own. Right. And so, anyhow, I turned around one day and I talked to June and I said, June, I said, here's, I'm going to make a deal with you. We're just going to consider you a widow. Mm -hmm. 
Because the Word of God teaches us to take care of widows right. and children. Am I telling the truth? Yes, amen. I said, we're just going to count you as a widow indeed, okay? Mm -hmm. I said, and what I mean by that is we're going to do everything we can. When, when you're short, we'll try to help you. We'll, you know, do everything we can. I said, but now here's the, here's the other end of that bargain. I expect you to be there when the church needs you. Right. Hello now. Uh -huh. That's what the Word of God teaches. Right. You don't just take care of the widow and the widow sits out every church service and, you know, and, and watches Joel Osteen on television and tells you she's had church for the week. No. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. June, that woman held up her end of the bargain like nobody's business. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't really even have to say that to her because she always did. Yeah. She was grateful for any help the church gave her. That lady was there every church service. She was faithful, prayer meeting. I mean, you name it, she was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, But that lady held up her end of the bargain. Every time we had anything to do, she'd be the one to volunteer. If we're going to have a dinner at the church, she's volunteering to help serve. And she's, you know, and that's the way it ought to be. You know, the Word of God said, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's right. Mm -hmm. Hello now. But that doesn't mean if you don't have a job, you should go hungry. Right. 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 Yeah. But what it does mean is if somebody helps you, hello now, uh -huh. you ought to do something. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, bless her heart, she had her, her litany of faults, but I'll tell you, one thing I appreciated about her is she always looked at things in terms of if someone does something for me, then I need to somehow do something in return. That was, that was a principle that she really lived by. And I'm glad because that's a good example. Too many people in the world today, they take everything they can get and run. That's right. And they feel no obligation. You know, you, it's not about dollar for dollar. You know, it's not about, you know, you've got to put in so much for getting so much. No, it's just any effort you make in response to what people are trying to help you with, that demonstrates that you're sincerely grateful and appreciative. You know what I'm saying? So that's the way people ought to act. Well, I'm going to tell you, June did. And that woman was there every time we did anything. I mean, everything we did. You know, when I had a demoniac come into the church, and I had to cast demons out of this poor lady, and it took us about three and a half hours. And I said to the church full of people, I said, I need those of you who know how to pray to stay, and those of you that if you're not prayed up, fired up, ready to go up, you need to go home. <laughs> Man, that building emptied so fast, I didn't realize. I didn't realize I had a church full of backsliders. <laughs> that building emptied so fast, all I had left was poor June and poor Leo. That's it, the two people that were left. And uh, But see, I mean, literally, that little lady was a prayer warrior. She, and uh, you can't ask for anything better than that. Amen. So distributing to the necessity of the saints... Uh, is one obligation we have as believers one unto another, given to hospitality. Now, this not only speaks to our conduct within the church, but also outside of the church. Mm -hmm. Given to hospitality. Tommy, in the 13 plus years he's known me, has kind of gotten aggravated with me because over the years I've opened my home to people. I've had people come in and stay with me. I've tried to help people every which way but upside down. Sometimes I've extended myself and it's bitten me on the backside. You know, I had an old friend that I came back into contact with after many, many years of not seeing her. Turns out she was living just an hour north of Dallas. Turns out she's part of the Rainbow Clan. Oh, I want to come down and be part of the church in Dallas. I'd love to come down and be part of your church. So what do I do? I open our home to her. She comes down. Oh, I just got to give you something. I just can't live with you for free and not give you something. We say, okay, well, how about $100 a month out of your almost $1,000 a month disability that she got? How about $100 a month just to cover the utilities and stuff, you know. Said the rest of it, save, because we want you to get your own place and get settled. We didn't want to 
you know, have a permanent house guest. That was not our plan. Right. Well, she lived with us six months, never one time, brother. Gave us that hundred dollars that she just had to do. It was her that insisted upon. I just had to do. Well, she sure forgot about that fast. Not one time in six months did we get a penny. We didn't say anything about it. We didn't kick her out over it, right? But boy, howdy, when we finally did get her out and uh, she and another lady in the church became roommates and got a little apartment somewhere, you know, two-bedroom apartment, Tommy said, don't you ever do that again. Don't you ever do that again. But how many people over the course of the last, those of you that have been in this church for the last 13 almost years, how many people have I tried to help? How many people have we tried to feed when they needed food? Have we given gas when they needed gas? Yeah. How many people have I let come stay in my home? You know, yeah. I mean, that that is my responsibility as a believer, and I can't help it. That's right. I'm going to do it. I'll probably do it again before it's all said and done. <laughs> to Tommy's chagrin. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Given to hospitality. Hospitality is... A principle that is so important to God that you have no idea. A lot of people don't. You, you try to explain to some people that one of the greatest offenses committed by Sodom and Gomorrah and their sister cities, one of the greatest offenses committed by those cities was lack of hospitality. And you try to explain that to some theologians and some so-called Christians. Oh, brother, they just get so aggravated because that ain't but a little tiny sin. Oh, no, baloney. That is a huge sin in God's eyes. Right. Uh -huh. Let me tell you something. How you treat other people is of the utmost importance to our God. Amen. And don't you think otherwise. Amen. It is extremely important to the Lord. The Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai were divided into two categories. One part had to do with our relationship with God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not worship uh, any likeness or any image of, you know, uh, create any likeness or any image of anything. Those things had to do with our relationship with Him. Then we get down, you don't lie, you don't steal, you don't cheat with another man's wife, you don't covet. Those are things that have to do with our relationship with other people. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said, that's why the Apostle Paul said, that the whole of the commandments, the whole of the commandments can be summed up in love the Lord your God with all your might and all your strength and all your might. He said, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, those two sentences sum up the entirety of the law. That's right. So if you think that hospitality is not a major issue in the eyes of God, you don't know God. Amen. Amen. But you know what, brother? Those same people who want to believe that the real issue was this, that, and the other thing, not hospitality, those are the same people that you go to their church hungry, you're going to go home hungry. Those are the same people who know that you're about to be evicted from your house and they're going to pat you on the back and say, we're praying for you. Those are the same people who know that you've got a job lined up but you don't have a car to get to it and they're going to say, well, brother, you're in my prayers. I was pastor in my first church. This is 30 years ago. I was just a little chickadee then. The Lord blessed me. I had two cars. Now, mind you, neither one of them was new, and neither one of them was fancy. So don't kid yourself. I had a little Dodge Dart and a little Ford Pinto station wagon, okay? So I was not living large, but I was blessed. Amen. Amen. I certainly was blessed. We had a young couple in the church. Um, yeah. 
had it, yeah, I can't think of the first names off the top of my head, but anyhow, that's right, y'all believe me. Uh, and Brad, Brad and Sue, that's who it was. And Brad came to me and he said, Pastor, uh, I have a job. He worked in construction and all, and he said, I've got a job, but it's way down in Norwalk, and they lived way up in the valley. And Norwalk, I mean, that, that was an hour's drive. And he said, it pays real good. He said, but I can't take my van because it's unregistered and I can't get the insurance on it because I've been out of work for a while. And he said, is there anything that you can, is there any way you can help me? Now, these people have been coming to our church for, at that point, several months, faithful to the core. You want to see this preacher jump through hoops to help you? Amen. You want to see me jump through hoops of fire to help you? You be a faithful member of the church. You be somebody I can count on to be there. Mm -hmm. that, that's all, Martin. I don't care how much you put in the offering plate. You be somebody that every time the door is open, I see you here. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee I'm going to jump through hoops to help you when you need help. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Brad told me, you know, he said, is, is there anything? He really didn't know what I could do, if anything, you know, but he was asking. And I said, yes, sir, there is something I could do. He said, here you go. Here's the key to the Pinto. He said, you take the Pinto, you drive it till you're done. Once you got the money for the insurance, and once you're able to get your van registered, then you give me back the keys to the Pinto, and you got your van. Took him about two months he drove that Pinto. I could care less. I'm going to take care of God's people. I'm going to take care of. I don't mean I'm going to in the sense of I'm the pastor, everybody look at me. It's not what I mean. I mean as a Christian. Because I'd have done the same thing if I were a member of the church in the pew. I'd have done the exact same thing. Okay? I have the means wherewith I can meet your need. Right, that's right. Brother Jack, have I done that since you've been coming to this church? Have I not handed the car keys over to somebody and said, here you go? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I had an extra. Right. I'll drive the church van. Mm -hmm. I hate driving that church van. <laughs> I got a couple of reasons. Number one, I can't cuss nobody when I get mad. <laughs> that is just that is just the curse of driving a church vehicle. I can't cuss nobody. You know. Get as mad and aggravated as I want to, and I gotta sit there and bite my lip because, bless God, if I say anything, you idiot, I say anything, it's gonna reflect on the church. Yeah. And then on top of that, whenever you drive the church van, you know, you got the name of the church blazing across the side of it. Yeah. I was going to the van today, I went to Walmart, pick up a few things. Now, I'm gonna, every beggar and everybody with a sob story, they see a church van, and guess what? They hang out at the bumper. <laughs> just waiting. <laughs> oh, yeah, this has got to be an easy mark. Because, after all, it's a church van. Oh, sir, are you with this church? No, I a guy pulled that today. God forgive me, Jesus, Lord, have mercy on my soul. I am way too direct for my own good. I said, what in the world do you want? <laughs> I, you know, please, the minute you ask me about the church yeah. on the side of my van, I know right where he's going. Mm -hmm. Honey, he may be looking into my eyes, but he's seeing my wallet. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. I said, what in the world do you want? Oh, never mind this. Okay. Got in the van. <laughs> Amen. But you know, brother, driving that church van is a pain in the neck because I become a mark yep. for everybody with a side. I do. I become, it's like a magnet. It draws people. Because again, I repeat, they assume, Brother Jack, that because I can cry crocodile tears for their need, that I have the resources to do anything about it. I might could feel for you like nobody ever felt for you. And I don't have a thing in the universe I could do to help you. Right. Our church is small. Mm -hmm. Our resources are extremely limited. Mm -hmm. 
You want us to help you? You want, you want this church to really go out of its way to help you? Why don't you make the first effort of trying to become part of the church? Yes. Because if you'll do that, then we will go out of our way to try to help you. But if you're going to stand there, and then I love, you know, as they sulk walking off, it's, well, I'll never go to your church. And I say, you never would come no way anyhow. <laughs> Who do you think you're kidding? You'd never have a plan in your brain to visit our church. How many people have we helped and they never step one That's foot? Right. You know, give me a break. Amen. Give me a break. But, so I don't like driving the church van. I don't. Well, on top of that, it's got a 10-cylinder engine and it gets about two miles to the gallon. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, honest to God, that thing is rough on gas. Uh, and it's as big as a school bus. You know? I mean, I don't much care to drive the church van, but I had my own little minivan, and somebody in the church needed a vehicle, so let them use my minivan, and I'll drive the church van. There's a way to fix the problem. There's a way to take care of it. And if there's a way to take care of it, then bless God, that's what we're going to do. And I got Tommy sitting there looking at me sometimes, like, are you sure you really want to? Well, it's kind of late now. Done handed over the key and showed them where the the uh, insurance card is. So <laughs> it's kind of late now. Amen. So given to hospitality. Hospitality is a, an extremely important part of living for God and being a Christian. Amen. Our you know our our resources. One thing that does not suit a Christian well is selfishness. Amen. Yeah. If, they, if you want to destroy your reputation and just blow your testimony right out the door, be a selfish person. Mm -hmm. yep. I've got a member of my family, Pentecostal lady. I want to, you ain't never met anybody in your life tighter with a dime. Good God. You know how thin a dime is? Mm -hmm. She has squeezed that thing so thin that you can see through it. <laughs> I mean to tell you. But I remember I, I stayed in her home for a period of time years ago. And I remember her coming home from her job. She worked at a school in the cafeteria. You know, she was one of the cafeteria ladies. And... Uh, She'd come home and say, oh, you know, one of the teachers at the school is pregnant, so they were taking up a, a little offering for her, and, or somebody's getting married, and they were taking up a little offering for them. And, put them, and I just told them, well, I don't even know that person. Why should I do anything better than that? And she never, brother, I kid you not, she never contributed to anything for anybody. And I'm telling you, and I'd sit there and I'd hear her and I would just cringe. Mm -hmm. Because I'd sit there and say to myself, what must her co-workers think of her? Mm -hmm. What must, her, her testimony must smell like a skunk. It must stink to these people. Mm -hmm. That is not the way to demonstrate the love of God. Mm -hmm. That is not the way, you know, there... If the Word of God said, the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. I remember in my first church again, when Leo and Sue come to me, I think it was one of the very first times they were telling me about June. And, it, and I said, well, you know what? Let's put some stuff together. I went into my little apartment that I had in the building that we were meeting in. Because I, I made a little office suite into an apartment on the second floor. We met on the third floor. So I went down to the second floor, and I virtually cleaned out my cabinets, my own groceries, mm -hmm. and put them in a box. And they said, well, brother, you don't, you're not going to have anything left. I said, oh, I'll have plenty left because I've got the faith to know God's going to take care of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got a whole lot left because I've got faith. 
I've got the sure knowledge that God is going to take care of me. Amen. God ain't going to owe me nothing. That's right. If I do this to take care of this land, if I give every grocery I've got away, I guarantee you before it's all said and done, God's going to take care of me. Amen. Don't you worry about that. Amen. So you see, that's the mentality. Well, the same thing's true. You know, your co-workers, they're taking them on. Well, bless God, I can't afford to give that money away to these people, you know. Let me tell you, you need, sometimes you need to do some PR for the kingdom. Amen. That's right. Amen. Hello now. Right. Sometimes you need to do some PR for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, I know if given $5 for this baby shower, if given $5 for this right. newlywed yeah. couple is going to put me a little bit in the hole, I know you'll take care of me. That's right. That's right. Because I'm doing this so that I can be Amen. a testimony, so that I can be a witness, yeah. so that Amen. I can show and demonstrate the love of God. Amen. Amen. And so hospitality is, is such an important thing. Generosity ought to be the earmark of God's people. And again, I repeat, anybody, if, if you know anything in the universe about me, you know when I've got it, you know, I, I was telling my mother the other day, kind of like... Uh, Jackie Gleason on the honeymooners, you know? He found a big satchel full of money. And boy, he was just spending it, spending it, spending it, you know? And his wife was saying, well, you, you know, you shouldn't be spending like that. And you ought to be more careful. And he said, I got it. And when I got it, I spend it. I get it. I do it. Yeah. And anybody who knows me knows that's true. Somebody needs help. I will bend over backwards to help you as long as I've got it. That's right. If I've got it, I'm going to help you. There's no yeah, question. Right. It's my nature, and I'm not, that's the way I'm going to do. Amen. And I don't regret it. I still don't regret it. I don't regret helping that couple that needed groceries at the motel. I don't regret doing any of those things for these people. I just think it's sad that, you know, their attitude is such that they don't feel obligated to even so much as yeah. come to church once to say thank you, you know. Yeah. But I, I don't regret helping people. I don't regret anything we've done. That's we had a young right. young couple come to church, had what, three kids or whatever it was, yeah. and we filled their tank with gas. And this is back when gas was still costing well over three bucks a gallon. Right. We spent 70-something dollars to fill their tank with gas. Mm -hmm. They come back the next Sunday expecting us to do it again. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. So hospitality, folks, I'm going to tell this, you, this is one of the most important issues. And this is one of the reasons why Sodom got burned to cinder. Mm -hmm. Because of their lack of hospitality. The Word of God Sorry. said they didn't care for their poor. They didn't care for those that were in the midst of them who were in need uh -huh. and were struggling. All right. Uh, verse 14, Paul said, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Remember what I said about spiritual principles often work in direct contrast right. to natural? Yep. Somebody persecutes you, first thing you want to do is... <laughs> May God turn your tongue to leather, you know. May fleas infest your armpits. May your beard grow until it touches the floor, lady. <laughs> you know, that's our natural response. That's how we want to react and respond. And yet, the Word of God said, no, bless them. So, as a child of God, we have to learn to let the spiritual response dominate in our natural life. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Amen. Ouch. <laughs> I'm not even stepping on nobody's toes today except my own. I'm just standing up here, you know, walking all over my own feet. That is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Yes, amen. amen. But Paul said, bless them which persecute you. Bless them. Dear God, how far off from the mark can the church world be? As 
as it is today. Amen. Uh -huh. We've got idiots calling for gay lesbian people to be thrown in jail and stoned. After all, that's what the law says. Can you not read? Mm -hmm. Bless and curse not. Amen. That means you don't wish anything evil on anybody. Even people that do you dirty. And honey, those people ain't even bothering you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. That's right. Amen. What they do in the privacy of their own home doesn't have any business with you whatsoever. Amen. And yet the church today is full of people. I dare say it's the majority of people in the church today who have this carnal mindset, brother, that they can run around cursing, that they can run around wishing the worst of things on people that they disagree with, that they don't, you know, think are living a godly life, blah, 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 blah. That is not what we're called to live like. That is not what a child of God is called to live like. Right. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. I can't say that any plainer than it's said. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. You know something? You might say, well, brother, now see, that doesn't work against human nature. You want to bet? <laughs> Amen. Somebody comes in the church and says, oh, I just got a new car. The Lord blessed me with a new car. Oh, we just closed our new house. The Lord blessed us with a new house. And you got all kind of people sitting in the pew. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, the Lord bless you, all right. Mm -hmm. I guess he just went to lunch when it come time for him to bless me. Oh, no, he didn't have no time to be bothered bless me. He was just all caught up in blessing you. Oh, his eyes were fixed on you, honey. You were the focus of all his attention because all his blessings just upon you. <laughs> Get all this jealousy going. Get all this envy going. Get all this negative. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> Somebody comes to you weeping because they lost somebody. Human nature is, oh God, I can't stand to be around a crier. Oh Lord, here we go. I wish she'd realize she got a snot bubble popping out of her nose. Lord Jesus, I don't need this right now. Oh God. You know, bless your heart, I'm praying for you, honey. But I've got a pot on the stove. You know what I'm talking about? So when the, when the Word of God said rejoice with them that do rejoice, weep with them that weep, that is not altogether a natural human response. You know, I love that old saying, misery loves company. Uh, it cracks me up. Misery may love company, but nobody likes to keep company with misery. Yeah. So you got one person that wants to party and nobody wants to go to that party. Because mm -hmm. honey, they nobody on this planet, everybody likes surprise parties, birthday parties, anniversary parties, but nobody likes a pity party. That's right. <laughs> so you know, you, you get somebody who's struggling, they're depressed. The, this is one reason why, thank God for psychiatrists and psychologists and counselors. Because they get paid to listen, so they're willing to do so. I guarantee if you weren't writing out a check for $200 an hour, sweetheart, they're not going to sit there for hours on end and listen to you tell your tale of woe. That's right. They're not going to sit there and listen so you can work through your issues and work through your problems and help you figure out what's going wrong in your life and why and how you can fix it. No, they do so because you're paying them to do so. Amen. People don't appreciate and don't value the ministry of a pastor. I'm going to tell you, a pastor does things other people get paid for, and 90% of the people in the church don't see any reason in the world why he needs to be paid. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. 
I've gotten down on the floor. I was called to a member of my first church's home one time. And I got down on the floor with that lady because she was literally, literally pulling her hair out of her head. She was having a full-blown nervous breakdown. Her, her family was going through a real, very serious issue. And this poor lady was just losing it. And I got down on the floor and I grabbed hold of her and I held her against me and I began to pray. And her husband stood there just biting his nails. He didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. These people were in there at the time, I imagine, probably their late 40s or so. And I mean, brother, I got to the house and he said, Pastor, I don't, I don't know what to do. I said, Connie has just lost her mind. I said, she, she just going crazy. And brother, I got right down on that floor with her, grabbed hold of her, pulled her tight against me, began to pray and ask God to intercede. And after a while, peace came and she finally began to calm down. And you know, we got to talking about things. She said, I'm so humiliated. I'm so embarrassed, Pastor. Oh, I can't believe that you would see me like that. I said, see you like what? See you like what? I saw you being human. I saw you struggling to deal with some things. Mm -hmm. That's all I saw. I said, and when I see that, my first obligation and my first inclination is, I need to get in there and help. Amen. Amen. Because the way my Bible teaches, nobody's supposed to carry their own burden. That's right. That's right. Amen. That's Bear ye that's one that's another's that's burdens. Amen. And so fulfill the law of Christ. I said, honey, all I saw was somebody needed somebody else to get in there with them. That's right. And help them carry that stone. That's what I saw. Yeah, Amen. Amen. But you see, people, brother, they don't think the pastor deserves to get paid for being there for people like that. You know how many people in the world don't for the life of them understand? Well, bless God, the church, you know, if the church is supposed to be God, then God should just bring money down from heaven to pay for everything. Well, if, if ministry is about spiritual things, then why should a pastor be paid? You have no idea what pastors do. You have no clue. They are counselors for people that can't afford counselors. That's right, amen. Hello now. Amen. Oh yeah, when you can't afford to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, your pastor, 90% of them anyway, are going to sit there and listen and let you talk and let you unburden yourself yes. and let you share your troubles and your woes. Half the time, I could be sitting there thinking, what a dingling. Because I can see where they made some stupid choices. I can see, you know, I mean, I'm just being honest. I can stand up here and lie, but I'm not going to. Right. There are times, brother, I'm listening to people, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, good grief. Mm -hmm. This person walked right into that mess. They, you know, they walked right into that. Do you know what I'm saying? Do I say that to them? No. I try to encourage them. You know, I try to... I had somebody write me on the internet just just today, I believe it was. A lady write me. I love when people do this. How can I ever find anyone to love me? I just can't find anyone to love me. What am I supposed to say? I'm sorry. Go down to Love R Us. They've got two for a dollar. You know, I mean, what kind of counsel do you expect? Seriously, you know. What kind of counsel do you expect to that? And then when I offer them sincere counsel, most of the time they don't much appreciate it. Because what I do offer them, I, I, I'm being honest and truthful, and I told her, I said, I'm going to tell you. I said, first of all, sweetheart, you need to learn to be happy being by yourself. You need to quit thinking in order to be happy, you've got to find somebody. Right. Said because you just got through telling me that everybody you ever find cheats on you, everybody you ever find does you dirty. I said, well, I'm gonna tell you why they do that because you don't value yourself worth a hang. Amen. And the Amen. way you think of yourself, you wind up finding people who think of you the same way. That's right. Amen. But when you learn to value yourself. Then 
you're going to attract people who are going to value you the way you value yourself. Amen. That's right. Said if you don't learn to love yourself, you will never find anybody that's going to love you the way you want to be loved. Said, but too many people are out there. They just think it's a crapshoot. You know, just you just keep one after another after until you get your head on straight. That's right. I'm telling you, until you get your head on straight, you ain't never gonna find it. It took me getting burned one time too many Amen. to finally realize, mm -hmm. you know what, i got to value myself a whole lot more than I do. Amen. I'm worth a whole lot more than the junk that I keep putting myself through. That's right. Amen. Went through one relationship for two years. By the time I got out of that mess, that person had me feeling so lousy about myself, it wasn't even funny. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was tore up. I mean, chewed up and spit out. I Amen. felt horrible about myself. Mm -hmm. And I finally realized, Jack. Mm -hmm. Finally. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how many of those lousy relationships did I go through before I finally realized I'd rather be happy alone than miserable with somebody? Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know how many people think that life is... You know, oh well, as long as I'm with somebody, it don't matter if I'm miserable. No, it does matter. When you learn and you finally realize, I'd rather be all alone. That's right. I'd rather wrestle with loneliness mm -hmm. than wrestle with rejection, mm -hmm. than wrestle with somebody not caring for me that ought to care for me, not somebody not demonstrating uh, any kind of affection for me that ought to be demonstrating. I'd rather be all by myself on my birthday lamenting that I'm single on my birthday than being in a relationship with somebody who doesn't even remember it's my birthday, doesn't care that it's my birthday, doesn't even so much as write me a note and say happy birthday on my birthday. Amen. But I went through a relationship for two years. Christmas came, nothing. Birthdays came, nothing. Not nothing. I'm, I don't mean a little bit of something. I mean nothing. It was almost like kicking you in the groin and saying, listen, stupid, this is how much I really don't care about you. Yes, amen. And I went through that, and I explained all this to her. And, and thankfully, she seemed to you know, receive it in, in a good way. But a lot of times when I try to offer people counsel like that, boy, they just hate it, you know, because that ain't what they want to hear. I don't know if they think, you know, I'm supposed to say, well, go to church and hunt you up a husband in church. Go to church. No, because I'm going to tell you, this preacher won't never tell you go to church and find you a good man. Go to church and find you a good woman. Because, sweetheart, that is the wrong reason to be going to church. Amen. Right. Amen. If that's your reason right. for going to church, then you ain't going to get out of church what you need to get out of church. Right. Amen. Because instead of receiving from the Lord, you're shopping. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. I've told people that they would do better to find another church because they come into our church and they thought they were going to hunt them up a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or, you know, whatever. I said, why don't you go get yourself a puppy? Come back to church and quit looking at people trying to see if you can't find somebody. Because, sweetheart, you will never benefit from God in your relationship with God Amen. if the whole time you're here, you're trying to find a relationship in the natural. Right. Amen. Amen. My Lord, have mercy. Amen. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. That really is not a natural response. But that's what we're called to do. Sympathy, empathy. These are things that Christian people are called to demonstrate. And I'm going to tell you, these are things that pastors tend, how can I say this? And I'm not thinking of myself when I say this, honestly. I'm thinking of pastors that I've known and pastors that I've had. But this is something that pastors tend to better demonstrate than a lot of the people in the pew mm -hmm. toward one another. Because they understand that this is, this is just part of Christian living, but it's especially a part of ministry. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, I've had to be there for people when 
Martin, Brother Martin, would I have much rather not had to have been there? And I don't mean in the sense that I had anything against the person or anything. I'm talking about uh, when a loved one's been in a car wreck and they're laying there on life support. Or when a little girl's going in for brain surgery and they've shaved the whole back half of her head and she got a slice going from here to yon and stitches and looks like Frankenstein and you know I've been there in some of those situations with people I've stood there I've stood there in the hospital with people when their loved ones in surgery and they're scared out of their mind and they're just almost you know yeah you know go to the hospital and see a man that's been burned horribly burned you know I'm the, but see, that's part of Christian living. I won't tell you. When we talk about, you know, putting yourself back a step and putting others ahead of you, preferring one another. Remember what we were talking yes, about last yes. time? Remember what we were talking yes. about last week? Preferring one another, putting other people ahead of yourself. Sometimes that puts you in some pretty rough spots, right. some pretty rough places. I remember one time I was going to... Uh, when I was in my internship in the Church of God in West Haven, Connecticut, I uh, was going to the hospital there in New Haven. And uh, one of our church members had a sister who was dying with cancer. And so I would go visit her maybe once or twice a week. And uh, then when I finished visiting with her, I said, well, I'm here, you know, at the hospital. I said, let me drop by some other rooms and just check in on people and talk to them and, you know, try to encourage them and all. And this one little girl, I walked in and she looked pretty normal and fine. She's laying in the bed. She's probably all of maybe 12. And I said, well, honey, and her mom's sitting off to the side. I said, honey, how are you? I said, are you, are you feeling all right today? She said, yes. And I said, well, what are you here for? May I ask you, what are you here for? And she looks at her mom and she said, Mom, don't start crying again. And I thought, oh, God, what bag of worms did I just break open? Right. And I look at her mother and her mother's eyes are just welling up with tears. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, because the girl looked normal. She looked healthy, you know. And then she looked at me and said, well, said, I've got a tumor on my brain and they've got to do brain surgery. And I said, well, you know, God is able to help you. God can give you a miracle. I said, we believe in the power of prayer. Mm -hmm. I said, would you like me to pray with you? And her mother, well, we have a pastor. We go to a church. We have a pastor. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, I said, I'll tell you what. I don't have to pray with you, but I sure can pray for you. Amen. I don't have to pray with you, but I can pray for you. You can't stop me from praying for you. That's right. And you know what? Going home that day, I prayed for that little girl like she was my own. Yeah. My heart broke for that kid. And she yeah. told me she was going in for surgery on a certain day. And I said to the mother, I said, would you like me to come and, and sit with you all while your daughter's in surgery? No, we have a pastor. I said, okay, well, mm -hmm. a lot of people have pastors. That doesn't mean the pastor can necessarily be there. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to be a surrogate. You know, right. you don't even have to go to my church. If you just like some spiritual support, I'm willing right. to be there. Yeah. Well, this lady had a bad attitude, but she was going through a lot. Right. To make a long story short, the day of the surgery comes, and of course I know the little girl's going in for surgery, so I'm praying for her, praying for her, oh God, mm -hmm. let that girl survive that surgery. And you know, she was telling me how serious it was, mm -hmm. and she could be blind, and you know, all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm just praying and praying that God will help things and, and keep the surgeon's hands, you know, in his hands, and so on and so forth. And then the next day, I go to the hospital, and I go in the little girl's room. I said, I'm here to check on you. I know you had your surgery yesterday. And she's sitting there all bright-eyed and pushy-tailed. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, everything went perfect. Mm -hmm. went great. And her mother was in a lot better an attitude. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I was praying for you all day yesterday. I said, honey, let me tell you. I don't know what time your surgery started. I don't know what time it ended. I said, but I was probably praying before they started. And I was probably still praying after they finished. 
said, I prayed in that mother. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. All of a sudden, she's Miss Sweetness and Pie. And I said, boy, I, I can't even see where they did anything. And she took her hair. She kind of had like a bob, you know. So her hair was all pretty much one length all the way around. And she went and reached back and she took her hair and pushed it up like this and turned her head. And when she did, she had a huge incision going down the whole length with stitches across it. And all of a sudden, I'm standing there and I'm not kidding. I was, it was like somebody hit me in the head with a bat. And I'm trying not to throw up, pass out. Seriously, it caught me off guard. You know, I wasn't expecting the kid to go, you know, and throw this in my face. But we weep with them that weep. We rejoice with them that rejoice. We're willing to be there for people in whatever their experience. If it's a good experience, then I'm there with you in that. I've got family members in my own family, I, 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 honest to God, they don't know how to be happy for you. Right. Mm -hmm. And that really disturbs me. Because mm -hmm. when something good comes their way, I'm happy to be happy for them. Right. Amen. Amen. Hey, you get a new car, I'm thrilled to death to rejoice with you over getting a new car. I don't have a new car. I don't have the money to get a new car. Right. But you know what? That doesn't hinder me for one right. second. Amen from enjoying your, enjoying your new car. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That doesn't stop me for one minute from rejoicing with you while you rejoice. I don't feel yes. jealousy. Yes. I don't feel right. envy. I don't right. feel anything negative. I'm happy for you. Amen. But see, it takes the Holy Ghost to help people to act like that. Mm -hmm. It takes God in your life to help people to know how to be happy for somebody else without yes. jealousy coming in, without envy coming in. Right. Amen. Yes. So rejoice with them that rejoice, weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. And I think I'm going to have to finish up with this verse tonight. Next week, hopefully, we'll finish the chapter. Be of the same mind one toward another. We ought to look at everybody in the house of God the same. Mm -hmm. yep. Again, that is not a carnal mindset. You'll notice, I'm going to tell you right now, and I'm not kidding, I've met a number of celebrities in my life. Uh, living in New York City, I had the joy of meeting a, a great number of very famous people. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I didn't meet a one of them that could walk on water. Amen. I didn't meet a one of them that could part the Red Sea or the Hudson Amen. or the East River. <laughs> I didn't meet a one of them that could go from Manhattan to Staten Island without a boat. <laughs> every single star, every single celebrity, Matthew Broderick, I knocked them right on his rear end on Christopher Street. Helped him get back up again and he ran from me like I was about to rob him. Every one of them was flesh and blood. Right. Every one of them was as human as I am. Just because they're on TV does not make them superhuman or Amen. superior. That's right. Amen. Just because they're famous, just because their face is seen, you know, all over the world in movies and whatever, that does, honey, they're as human as anybody. That's right. Amen. And one of the things that I've admired in a lot of the people I've met is just how real they are. You know, how down to earth they are. Kathy the genie yeah. from Sister Act fame. Yeah. Boy, she was the sweetest thing. Bless her. She was so cool. Neat person. Mm -hmm. You know, Hume Cronin. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the most famous, you know, I mean, that man and his wife were two of the most famous actor and actresses, you know, in the entire world. Wonderful uh, talents, you know. 
just as down to earth as anybody. God was talking to him about his wife, and dear God have mercy, he just sat there and gushed on her. She was passed away by then. Mm -hmm. And he just gushed on her and bragged about her like any old man would brag about his wife. Mm -hmm. Just as human as anybody. Mm -hmm. I got news for you. If I had the opportunity to meet Queen Elizabeth, I, I think it was an honor. You know, I think it was wonderful and lovely. She, But I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't look at her like she was some divine character come right. down to... Yeah earth to meet with me. No. One thing you'll find, I believe strongly in this and I always have believed. I do not believe in celebrities in the church. This baloney that has been created in our society, especially here in the U.S. of A. over the last many years, especially since the advent of television and all that sort of thing. We've got all these celebrity preachers. Oh, bless God, if you really want to have somebody preach in your church, you got to have this one or that one because they're all over the television. Why, everybody knows them. Well, of course, well, who cares? Who cares? I'm going to tell you something. God can send an evangelist from the backwoods of Tennessee that nobody knows from Jack the Ripper. And that man can do more of a work of God in your church. He can bring more enthusiasm. He can bring more encouragement. He can be more of a catalyst for revival than any celebrity preacher that ever was. But when you've got the wrong mindset and you see people at different levels, then I'm going to tell you a little secret. You become distracted from God and you become distracted from God in them and you become distracted from God working through them for the distraction of who you perceive them to be. Yes, that's right. Amen. The Pope. Dear God. Got millions of people. Pope goes to Chile or Brazil or whatever. And these people are just jumping over themselves so they can lay eyes on the Pope. Whoop de doo. I got news for you. I could be visiting Rome, Italy. The Pope could drive past me in his little donut mobile, and I wouldn't even turn my head to look at him. I don't worship a man. I don't hold any man. Mm -hmm. And that includes a and, and Catholic person that watches this. You better hear me now. Paul was not talking merely about your fellow believer in the church. He was talking about the ministry. He was talking about the people that are in leadership. We all ought to be like-minded one toward another. Yes, right. amen. Amen. This baloney of title mongering mm -hmm. and position mongering. Dear God, I'm so sick of it, I could scream. Yeah. So tired of it, I could scream. Mm -hmm. I've told you, I don't know how many times, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. We called our pastor brother. Mm -hmm. Brother Barlow, Brother Babcock, uh, Brother Harmon, yeah. Brother Peterson, Brother, you know, uh, brother Anton. That's what we called our pastor. That's all you have to call me. Now, if you call me pastor, that's fine. But you don't have to. I don't ask for it. I don't request it. I don't demand it. I don't expect it. I appreciate being acknowledged as part of God's family. You can call me brother. Amen. Be like-minded one to another. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. People in this life, my God, what are high things? High things, wealth, prosperity. You know, we bend over backwards when Brother Rich comes in the church. Boy, we can't, we can't get him to a seat fast enough and be throwing pillows under his bum lest he break a pelvis bone. 
And then you let poor little sister Jackson come in, poor as a church mouse. Well, find your own seat, lady. In the back. I think we got a folding chair that'll accommodate you, you little heifer. Hey, some of the biggest churches in Dallas, honey, if you're a if you're a celebrity, they want to make sure you get on camera. Because that helps let people know that their church attracts celebrities. So they got a whole section laid out for the celebrities. That is unscriptural. It is unscriptural. According to the word of God, it is sin. It is sin. You'll find this preacher is very old-fashioned. I'm going to tell you right now, Jennifer Garner can walk through this door today. I'm going to say, hey, we're sure glad to have you out. Enjoyed your last movie. You ain't going to see me. Well, you need to sit up here. You need to, oh, bless God, somebody go get her a blanket. Somebody get her a pillow. Let's put her feet in water. <laughs> you know, you're not going to see that in this church. Because I don't believe that's the way we ought to behave. Yes. And the, I'm, I told you the other day, I was telling you about a little lady at the Riverside Church of God. Poor as a church mouse, bless her hearts. Rather simple-minded even. And but one of the most faithful saints of God. I'm going to tell you, one of the most faithful saints of God. Even Aunt Dorothy commented one time about how this woman really kind of shocked her, surprised her. Because my Aunt Dorothy had mentioned a prayer request in church. And uh, about a week later, this, this lady, Sister Alexander, come to Aunt Dorothy and said, well, How is your niece doing? that you're praying over, you know, that situation in your family, you know, your sister's family, and blah, blah, blah. And my Aunt Dorothy said, oh, well, you know, thank God it, it was resolved, and blah, 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 and, you know, everything's going good now. And Sister Alexander said, I'm so glad. She said, I, I had such a burden for her. I've been praying all week. Oh, my and my Aunt Dorothy said, now, see, everybody thinks... Everybody knows Sister Dowell's a prayer warrior. Everybody knows Sister So-and-So's a prayer warrior. Everybody knows if you need prayer, go to Brother So-and-So. But nobody in the church ever thought about Sister Alexander. Mm -hmm. But here she was a week later, still asking my aunt about that prayer request from last Sunday. Mm -hmm. Because she'd been praying for it all week. Nobody else in the church asked her about it. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they don't look at Sister Alexander the same way they look at Sister Dow, and the same way they look at Sister Shields, and the same way they look at this one and that one. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. We ought not to do that. That's right. Yes. We ought not to do that. That's why the Word of God teaches if there's an issue within the church that could otherwise go to a court of law, the Word of God tells us that believers are not to go in front of a judge. We're not supposed to take a fellow believer to a court of law. But the Scripture said if there's an issue that needs to be settled in that fashion, said you go to somebody in the church of low estate. Go to somebody that doesn't have some great big reputation, doesn't have some great big lot of something going on. And let them preside over the proceedings. And you share your story with that individual and let them come to a conclusion concerning it. What? Now, isn't that the exact opposite? Yeah. yeah. Remember what I said about spiritual things tend to work in direct contrast? Isn't that exactly the opposite? No, we're going to look for the smartest guy in the room. We're going to look for the guy with the most education, the guy that makes the most money, the guy that owns the biggest house, the guy that drives the fanciest car. That's the one that we think is going to have more of an ability to reason out this issue. But God says, no. Go to somebody of Lotus. You know why? They haven't got an investment in it in the universe. They don't have one single ounce of skin in the game. No skin off their nose one way or the other. And you're going to get a lot more honest a response out of that individual than these others. Do you follow what I'm saying? Amen. So he said, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. And I close with this today. 
A wise man does not see himself as wise. If you think you're wise, then there's a good chance you're not. Right. Amen. Yeah. One, of, one of the things about wisdom, wisdom works hand in hand with humility. Mm -hmm. Amen. You will not see wisdom at work in a life filled with pride. Oh, Lord. Amen. You will not see wisdom at work in a life filled with arrogance. You will never see wisdom operating through somebody who is self-important and self-absorbed. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I, I hate using this example, but I've got a family member. Bless his heart. He just loves to sit there and try to act like he's, you know, that wise sage atop Mount Kilimanjaro that you have to climb mountains to finally reach, you know, and hear. And he sits there and acts like he's got all this wisdom just pouring out of his veins and pouring out of his pores. And yet, again, this is the same person who cannot be happy for you when something good's going on in your life. That's right. He will go out of his way, brother, to not have to even face your blessings and your good things. Move into a new house, it'll be a year before you get him to come see it. Buy a new car. It'll be, but you know what? Let him buy a motorcycle. Let him buy something. He will drag every person on the planet that he comes into contact with outside to see his new gadget. Yeah. Got news for you. Wisdom doesn't work through people who are self-important and self-absorbed. Wisdom can only work when we are operating from a place of humility. Therefore, the wise do not see themselves as wise. Be not wise in your own conceits. No, if you're genuinely wise, then you understand there's always more room for more wisdom. Right. Hello now. Amen. If you've really got any wisdom at all, then you know that there's always room for jello. As long as that jello is spelled W I S D O M. There's always room for wisdom. Amen. I could always use more. The Word of God said, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. They're in the fool in the church. You shouldn't be asking God for wisdom every time he prays. That's right. How many of us do? I step on toes for a minute. How many of us ask for God for wisdom when we pray? If you ain't asking, then obviously you think you got enough. Mm -hmm. That's right. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally, and I pray that not. Sweetheart, we all ought to be praying for wisdom. I ask God for wisdom every day, all day. Every time I pray, I'm asking God for wisdom. I had a little lady come to me in the church I grew up in. And she had a prophetic ministry. And uh, she came to me one day and she said, Chuck, she said, I'm going to tell you what God has shown me concerning you. She said, the Lord showed me that he is going to give you wisdom well beyond your years. And I remember saying, oh, thank you, Jesus. Because I've been praying for that. And then when I pastored my first church, I was 19 years old. I look at kids 19 years old now and I think to myself, I was that age when I was pastoring my first church. Because most 19 year olds I know, you know, are borderline airheads. They just don't have a clue yet, you know. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm picking on them. I'm teasing. Thank God we don't have any young people in the audience tonight. But if we did, I probably wouldn't have said that. <laughs> But, you know, I look at the way 19-year-olds behave and act and, you know, and conduct themselves. I think, I was 19 when I pastored my first church. I had situations, brother, that came into my first church that, I, I, I look back and think, dear God, 
how in the world did I ever muddle my way through that? And my overseer, my district overseer, Brother Carver, the pastor I'd done my internship program in under, he said to me one day, he said, Chuck, he said, I've got to tell you, son, he said, God has given you a capacity for wisdom like I have never seen in my life in anybody your age. So what Sister Emma prophesied, he was confirming had indeed come to pass. Does that mean I can sit back now and say, oh, bless God, I'm so wise. I just need to go buy me one of the big owl set of eyeglasses and just sit here and say who and answer people's questions. No, there's always room for wisdom. Amen. The first thing wisdom teaches you is you ain't never got enough. Amen. Would you stand with me this evening? We've made it through verse 16.